Good afternoon and welcome everyone to CPA webinar Brexit update. My name is Fabiola and I work as an events and membership executive for the CPA. Today I will be helping our hosts Peter Keblehorn, CPA chief executive and Duncan King, CPA senior technical manager to run the webinar. This webinar will provide an update to CPA members and no members alike on the outstanding issues of con of concerns following the UK EU trade and cooperation agreement, particularly around CA marking, new borders control, and logistics for construction product manufacturers, as well as the impact of all this on product availability. For the first 15 minutes, Peter will give a general presentation. He will then be joined, joined by Duncan, and they will together touch up on the CA marking. The last 15 minutes will be dedicated to answering your questions, so please feel free to type your queries in the Q&A box and at the end of the presentation I will be reading them out to Peter and Duncan. Before turning the floor over to Peter Kebleron and Duncan King, I want to remind you all that the webinar will be recorded and the chat will be active for comments. However, I invite you all to type your questions in the Q&A box. We hope to post the recording on the CPA website within the next 48 hours. Thank you. Peter, you can feel free to begin. Fabi, thank you very much for that great introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope uh, wherever you are, uh, you're warm and comfortable. And uh, we hope we can enlighten you a little bit on, uh, on where we are on uh, Brexit six months on. It's six months. Who would who would believe it uh, since we uh, entered into this uh, new arena uh, and at least some of the politicians stopped talking about it, which was, I don't know about you, but a great relief to me. Now, uh, the serious bit about this, of course, is that we've been moving through the Brexit arena um, in the middle of a pandemic. And that's possibly uh, something that nobody ever considered we would be confronting. Having said that, uh, it has been quite amazing how the economy has been performing and particularly how uh, construction has been performing both during the pandemic and, of course, through this uh, through this transition uh, in Brexit. So we, we wanted this afternoon to just give you a little bit of a, a, a brief view of, of all the different factors that, that, have been, that have been going on specifically with regard to Brexit, but also, of course, uh, tap into some of the analysis and some of the thinking we've been doing on some of the other issues that are coming down the track uh, in relation to the Brexit um, changes. So, as I say, the, the economy uh, has been bouncing back significantly. Uh, our colleagues in the economics team tell us, you know, that that Certainly for construction, there is a lot of activity and a lot of demand. And of course, that is bringing its own pressures with regard to product availability uh, that we've, we've covered elsewhere. Um, we also feel that, that, you know, that there are significant underlying pressures uh, driven by that demand and in particular with regard to inflation. So we'll see how that pans out later in the year. But of course, all of us should be um, should be very thankful, I think, for the fact that we have seen the industry really continuing to provide sensible support to the UK economy and to ensure that we can continue as a, as a thriving sector within the UK. Now, just coming on to some of the issues that, that confronted us uh, around the turn of the year, Obviously, we saw that initially there were holdups at the borders. There was uncertainty with regard to paperwork of certainly lorries crossing the border. Um, and it's true to say that there have been knock on effects. But for the most part, large organisations are now starting to uh, weather that storm. Uh, and we do see that goods, for, generally speaking, have been moving relatively freely. Uh, but there have been other elements that have that have come into play. One of the things, though, that I think I just want to make clear is the fact that that the the border uh, the border constraints that we've seen um, actually uh, are only an interim interim phase, and the full degree of border um, border controls will actually come in 
uh, if they keep the plan, uh, on January the 1st next. So there's a whole new level of discussion, new level of control, new level of procedures that everybody needs to get uh, acquainted with before then. So we, we have seen uh, that uh, those issues have, have been uh, worked through uh, and the ports uh, are certainly um, well on with, with preparation. Slight worry there though, the ports tell us that they do need to build new facilities and those new facilities um, will take time to construct. Equally, it's the old story of new personnel, new training to those personnel to before we get everything running. So we will keep an eye on how that develops and how things are moving forward. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, I mentioned about transport. Uh, clearly, um, we've seen in the news recently some, some problems with regard to uh, shortages of drivers. Uh, that, is, that is just as true for construction as it is true for other parts of the economy. The Road Haulage, Haulage Association tells us that we are many tens of thousands drivers short for the demand. And further than that, we, we have also suffered a significant shortage of drivers passing their uh, required exams and tests. And that adds another 30,000 at least to, to the required list. This has primarily been, been caused by constraints caused by the, the pandemic with regard to the, uh, the DVLC uh, in Swansea. So that is causing a significant problem. Uh, on top of that, we, we also see a significant problem with regard to skills right across the whole economy, but particularly with regard to skills um, in construction. And how that will actually uh, play out uh, is difficult to say at the moment. We, we do know that there are a significant number of skills needed at all levels right across the construction industry. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, you know, this, this is, has an impact on transport, but it also has an impact on on-site construction. And let's not forget that there is also a significant amount of skills required in the construction and in the supply chains as well. So a lot of issues there. And we, we can see that government is looking at how they, they treat skilled workers from abroad again. Uh, they're also encouraging us to recruit from the UK. But of course, getting those skills um, up to speed, getting people trained to the requisite re requirement, it, it still takes a long time. And balancing that against the significant demand the industry is seeing uh, causes a significant shortfall and a significant challenge. So I think that those, those pressures are significant going forward. Uh, and uh, all we can do at the moment is, is keep um, analyzing the situation and making sure that everybody is clearly aware of where we're going with some of those some of those perspectives. Now I think the the other element to to bring into this is of course um, product availability and global shortages. So many people's eyes we have had uh, in this interim period um, a perfect storm because we have been attempting to navigate our way through Brexit in the middle of a pandemic and uh, in a period where there are global commodity shortages, where there have been significant interruptions to the supply chain. I'm thinking, for instance, the, the um, holds up in the uh, Suez Canal and also uh, more recently a COVID outbreak in China, uh, which has caused significant problems in closing one of their main port of entry points. So all of those together are causing uh, real concern across the, the whole supply chain. And of course, uh, they all are operating as independent factors. And, and when they play together, we do notice it uh, in the UK supply chain. Now, Again, putting a UK perspective on that, we, we do realise that there is a relatively small percentage of construction products that are imported into the UK. But there are two other factors that we've got to take account of. One is the fact that some of those imports are really important, high value 
unique products. And also the way of the world these days, many supply chains actually are more complicated than just made in Britain. Uh, many, of, many of the manufacturers in the UK require components from other parts of the world. And in turn, their supply chains have been disrupted by all these various factors. So we're seeing that right now. We're seeing that it is really difficult to ensure that production continues, that output is, is um, smooth, and it is essential that everybody keeps an eye on how things are developing. Now, let me bring you back to Brexit. So in terms of looking ahead, in terms of seeing exactly what's coming down the tracks. We know about the bureaucracy. We know about the slight changes um, of direction that we have got to uh, adopt in terms of imports and exports, of course. But most importantly, we are uh, concerned about the implementation of new regs and standards. And so at the moment, we have a situation where we are pretty much aligned with the rest of Europe. But the government have, have said a couple of times that um, they, they may choose to, to go in a different route. And I think that does cause industry and, uh, and certainly manufacturing some cause for concern because clearly construction, particularly manufacturing construction, is, is based upon a European, if not world, basis of ensuring that standards are joined up, ensuring that we are all playing to the same criteria. One of the factors driving uh, our needs to, to join up is to ensure that we all operate to the same British, European and international standards. Those are at the core of how we define performance, how we define the properties of, of products and commodities. One conversation that's been going on for some time has been the membership of British standards within SEN and SENLEC. That I'm pleased to say has now been has now been resolved for at least a few years in terms of SEN and SENLEC have now created a new membership category for British standards. And whilst the, the signatures are not on the piece of paper yet, uh, certainly there is agreement to agree over this point at least. And so for the at least the interim period, we will be seeing British standards continue to be part of the SEN, SENLEC operation. It is still a matter of concern and a matter of worry as to how the, uh, how the Commission, the European Commission, will drive different regulations and different standards and whether in fact those it will be acceptable to the UK government and if they are not acceptable, how that will play out in terms of opening up a division between the direction that, that standards and regulations will work in the UK in comparison with the rest of Europe and how that impacts on the overall system. And we just don't know yet. So we, again, have to keep our eyes on that. Having said all that, uh, at the heart of, of construction standards is harmonised standards, now called designated standards. And some of you may know that, that for some time CPA has been tracking the issue with regard to the implementation of CA mark and all the other factors that revolve around it. And we have been developing an ongoing live document to consider the, the issues around that. Now, at this point, I'd like to uh, invite Duncan to join me. And in particular, what we wanted to do was just uh, have a conversation about all the elements that we have discovered that related to it. So, Duncan, do you think at this point you could just give um, our audience, uh, run, if we could run through the outstanding document key points and just give them an update uh, as to where we think we are, please. OK, uh, we can do that one, Peter. You would think that having set up uh, a duplicate system in the United Kingdom uh, on this subject, which is exactly the same as what we've had in Europe, everything would be tickety-boo. But when you actually get down to the nitty-gritty, there are all sorts of hiccups in the process which are, are, are causing problems, uh, both for our own manufacturers in this country and for the manufacturers in Europe who will want to export uh, back to us. Um, 
the main issue there is that on the 1st of January next year, uh, all construction products covered by designated standards or UK technical assessments will have to uh, affix a UK CA marking to their product rather than the CE mark. Now then, uh, that causes problems because to get a UK CA mark, uh, you have to use uh, the system uh, under the uh, uh, construction products regulation in the United Kingdom of using a UK approved body for most of the system of assessment and verification of constancy of performance. Now then, that means that everybody uh, who had any tests done on their products manufactured in this country and those were carried out in the, in the EU uh, is going to hit some problems because the UK approved body uh, was not set up uh, when those um, tests were taken place. So those who are manufacturers in the UK are going to have to swap from a, uh, a EU notified body over to a UK approved body. Now then, for that to happen, the UK approved body is taking on the legal responsibility for all that work. So therefore, they need to be absolutely certain of what they're signing up to and taking on in regard to test certificates from uh, across the channel are, are legitimate. Now, in most cases, they will be, but there are in the system, uh, such as the system three, uh, where you only have a notified body involved in setting up the initial type testing. After that, everything else on factory production control, etc., is down to the manufacturer. Uh, now we hit the hiccups there. One of the major hiccups is that while the UK is actually recognising all of everything that's going on in Europe, the Europeans, in the shape of the European Commission, have refused to recognise any of the standards and test reports that we have had in this country. So automatically, anybody exporting from here is stymied. So that hits their bottom line. Now, the, the ministers uh, in this country are well aware of that, in, uh, that particular problem. Uh, CPA has been talking to them uh, for several months now on this level. And we, we have managed to get it uh, up to ministerial level, I think, Peter, at this stage. Mm, that's right. Uh, which is good because that's the guy who makes the decision on which way we actually progress to try and get out of this problem. Um, Allied to all this, we now have what I'm going to call test capacity problems because everybody is rushing to the UK now to try and get their products through the testing system in this country. And that is causing a, a problem uh, through a lack of uh, capacity, shall we say, for the amount of supply that is required of people having products tested. We have the Europeans sending stuff over here that needs to be tested. We've got products from around the world coming in to be tested which actually is causing headaches for our own manufacturers who have got new products they want to bring online uh, and they can't find test uh, time uh, at any of the test uh, bodies for this. So that is uh, something, again, which I think the date of the 1st of January is compressing that problem into a very, very small uh, number of months now. We've only got six months left of this year. I'm of the opinion that I think that date will get pushed back. Uh, we've had no confirmation uh, that it is going to happen or when it's going to happen. It's just a, a gut feeling I've got that people are going to realise that it is there is insufficient time for all that work to take place uh, between now and the end of the year for products to flow naturally. And I don't know about you, Peter, but I think we, we're heading at this stage for potential product shortages. No, absolutely, Duncan. And, and uh, you know, we, we know from um, the input that we've had from uh, various uh, manufacturers uh, that certainly at the moment, if nothing happens, there are significant um, problems ahead. So in the it just in the capacity and capability, um, for instance, we have we have had um, highlighted to us that there is no capability in the UK for uh, testing radiators. Um, very little testing capability for adhesives and sealants. And so particular products are, are highlighted at the moment in terms of, well, what are we going to do? Because the, these are not uncommon. Uh, nearly every house in the country um, uses a radiator of one sort or, or another. Um, so 
the issue that we are trying to flag up uh, on a on a pretty continuous basis is to say, look, here are the here are the issues with regard to straightforward shortages. But equally, there is there is a concern um, over the, the quality, over how we are going to uh, modify the capability of the industry going forward. Uh, and, and this is in particularly uh, a, a, an important time with the publication of the Building Safety Bill yesterday. There is a there is a significant need to ensure that all products on the market are up to scratch, are uh, properly tested, properly certified. Um, and, and so the, the drive in, in one direction from the building safety perspective is to ensure that we absolutely have everything nailed. The, the issues that we're examining here in terms of the implementation of a new system of, of testing and certification is, shall we say, not quite pushing in the opposite direction, but certainly pulling us off track. And I think that that's pretty serious, really, as we as we go forward, Duncan. And, you know, we, we know from conversations with uh, manufacturers how worried they are. Um, and, you know, I think the, the the other element to it, of course, is is also that um, because of this regime that we, we are now looking at, uh, many of are by default having to double test having having to double certify and that in its own right um, is a huge cost burden to industry and again we are trying to to uh, pull up data so, so certain areas of course are pretty confidential but nonetheless we're trying to identify across the industry just how much additional cost and burden this is this is um, pr providing to industry because money spent on these kind of processes is not going to be spent on new innovative products, on, on uh, moving forward, on, in, on ensuring that we have um, greater grip on environmental issues. So, you know, the, the impacts are, are real uh, and they will have consequences for years to come. So, uh, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a whole um, load of things that just stem from from this change, um, Duncan, do you do you want to just have a uh, have a little bit of a, um, a, a enter into the discussion a little bit about the wider area of of um, uh, standards in terms of designated standards, harmonised standards, and and that kind of um, area? Okay, um, the list of harmonised standards, which uh, we've worked to for many years now under the Construction Products Regulation. Uh, has been adopted in the United Kingdom as designated standards uh, under the control of the Secretary of State. Now, the Secretary of State can decide which standards from anywhere in the world can be designated. Now, that being the case, we could end up with uh, ISO standards, American standards even, for instance, uh, the British standards being designated standards, which will be a totally different listing from what we have in Europe at the moment. So we're getting a mishmash of, of problems for manufacturers having to face. And if they're going to uh, supply the European market, they've got to make sure they use their standards. If they're supplying somewhere else, if they've got to use a different standard, that's going to cause a knock on effect with testing again and costs uh, 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 and issues like that. So it, it's getting quite complicated for manufacturers to know which way to move. Uh, mm -hmm. If we can keep, uh, avoid any uh, any diversity there, so much the better. And I think that's the key to it, is keeping to the same sort of set of rules and requirements for everybody to work to. Absolutely. I, yeah, yeah, I mean, cons the, what industry does need consistently is consistency. Yes. And what and, and what we need is is to is to not get any things cropping up that will cause any sort of uh, questioning of how how we are moving forward, uh, along with a level playing field as well. And I think many will see the current situation where um, certainly in transition, um, it, it potentially is easier for uh, European um, companies to land products in the UK than it is ironically for UK manufacturers to get their stuff on the market. While this while this transition keep continues, while that uncertainty continues, it, it is 
it is a significant problem uh, for um, certainly the manufacturing sector. So, you know, what are we what are we trying to do about this anyway? Because having uncovered uh, a lot of detail, a lot of problems, um, is there any way we can we can navigate forward? And certainly, Duncan and I have been uh, firstly trying to analyze all the things that that we've been um, talking about. We have been calling for examples from across the sector and certainly from CPA members who've been really fantastic at providing information. So that gets us to a point of, of uncovering the facts, as it were. We, we have circulated that amongst uh, officials and also amongst a wide selection of, of CLC and CPA members. We have also started to develop a, um, a roadmap because a logic would uh, logic would have us believe that um, what we need to do, having identified all the things that industry needs, we need to map this out in terms of a smooth transition from where we are now to where government would like us to be. And what we are trying to do right now is identify exactly how much capacity we need in terms of testing and certification, how long it will take to develop those facilities and how long it will take to train the people needed and make sure that those facilities are up and running. And then of course, implement that new capability and capacity to actually get all the products that we need through the system. Now, our broad brush uh, analysis suggests that that will take around two years. Having said that, we are very open to other analysis, other people's viewpoints, uh, and we would like to ensure that wh whoever has a part to play in this, please let us know, because we will add that to the mix. But the important thing is establishment of the principle that a smooth transition is needed, not just a cliff edge which at the moment uh, we're pretty convinced will result in significant uh, disruption to the industry, significant disruption to the supply chain. Um, and that is a, a real cause for concern. I think one of the issues we've got, Peter, if you don't mind interjecting here, is that we've got two sides of the argument here. We've got the United Kingdom side and we've got the European side. And whereas we can put uh, influence uh, the government in this country uh, and talk to them, there's no way that the European Commission is even wanting to discuss no. this with anybody, even with their own manufacturers over there. No. Um, no. We have we've taken some uh, bold steps with our sister organisation, uh, Construction Products Europe, uh, to try and break into the Commission, but even they have been turned down. So the process they're now following over there is that they're getting their senior uh, and major companies uh, who make construction products to write to their MEPs and to their own national governments saying, explaining the whole situation here, that as from January the 1st, they're going to have to have a double testing just to keep their export markets open. And it's ridiculous that the, the whole idea of mutual recognition uh, is not being discussed. Um, so we've got no influence over what happens on that side. We've just got to pray that, in fact, that the manufacturers over there uh, can actually put sufficient pressure on their MEPs and national governments to in turn put pressure on the Commission to try and uh, be sensible about this whole process. Otherwise, we will hit shortages as well over here uh, mm. and they will have their bottom line uh, affected. Mm. And in fact, I've heard that there are some manufacturers in Europe who are actually talking about if the situation doesn't change, they will just drop the UK from their portfolio of exports. Yeah, uh, and that I find alarming insofar as that uh, we will suffer over here. We'll, ha we'll have a series of partly completed buildings which we can't complete. Absolutely. Absolutely, Duncan. I mean, yeah, and, that, and this, this is, is a, a significant part of the whole picture. Um, now, I want to try and be slightly optimistic um, because we, we, we've, we've been fairly um, doom mongering. But uh, and I think the one thing I can say is the fact that since we started this, this discussion back at the, at the midpoint of last year, um, we've, we've increasingly been able to make the points to officials in government. Uh, and certainly 
um, we've been very pleased with the engagement that we have we've had from MHCLG and Bayes. And certainly the officials that have been engaged with us um, are taking on board what we've been saying, are fully aware of the, the issues we uh, are identifying, um, and they absolutely are paying attention and looking at possible solutions. So uh, at least in that period, we have been able to go from a fairly uh, low base to a position, as you said earlier, where we've, we've been able to address it to the construction minister directly, to senior officials, and, uh, and open up uh, quite a few channels of conversation to say, okay, so we understand the policy position, but we also need to identify the practicalities at the coalface um, and how are we gonna navigate those and move forward and keep construction moving uh, keep the supply chains running and I think that that's really where we're we're trying to focus so Duncan thank you for that um, it would it would not be right uh, in finishing this part of the um, discussion this afternoon without also mentioning reach now I'm I'm pretty certain that that many of you listening will will know reach but just to explain reach is the system that was brought in quite a long time ago uh, to identify all chemicals and ensure that they were safe for use or at least uh, everybody understood what their characteristics were. So in the Brexit move we now have created REACH UK and of course again the, there are significant changes in moving from a pan-European system into a system which is orientated just for the UK. At the moment, we understand the situation is that uh, every chemical to be used in the UK has to be re-registered. There, there is a process going on uh, called grandfathering of rights, uh, but again, as we understand it, this is quite complicated, quite costly, um, and is not universal. So we are facing at the moment a situation where many chemicals um, unless there is there is a change to the current provisions um, on the turn of the year, January the 1st, 22, um, many chemicals may not be available. And of course, chemicals are in just about everything in this context. So again, we see this as another layer of complexity, another layer of problems for industry to grapple with and another layer of, of issues that we have to make clear that if we don't get some sort of uh, some sort of adjustment either in time or in terms of process chemicals will become unavailable and therefore products equally will become unavailable now there's a great worry to us because it, it we, we just see this as yet another mountain to climb once we've gone through the ca mark uh, um, issues uh, and of, and of course being chemicals it is one stage removed from uh, certainly the CPA. So we have been, um, we've teamed up with the Chemicals Industries Association uh, as they are the lead um, group in this particular problem. But we do understand that at the moment there is very little to celebrate. And so we're keeping a close eye on how that's going because we certainly don't want to get th get through the CA marking situation and have a solution, uh, only to find that uh, we're still almost back to where we were because of the problems in uh, rolling out Reach UK as well. So I think that, that, that we've got to keep a focus on what's on the horizon, what's coming down the track. Um, I think there are there are quite a few um, turns and twists yet to the whole Brexit transition uh, a process. And so we will continue to keep our eyes open in terms of any other issues that have yet to, to surface in terms of how we navigate and how they may affect uh, certainly CPA members, but also the sector uh, generally. Duncan, before we wrap this up, anything else you wanted to, to add to, to the conversation? No, I, I don't think so, Peter, at this stage. Uh, it's still complex. There's still a lot of balls are having to juggle will they keep in the air. Um, we haven't got all the answers yet. Um, 
Uh, and we're actually waiting for those answers from the ministers from our side of the channel. Mm. Now, and how far those uh, will uh, satisfy issues that are happening the other side of the channel, uh, I've got my doubts, quite frankly, mm. on that aspect mm. of it. So no matter what we decide over here, there will still be issues, I think, coming from the European side. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Duncan. I absolutely agree. Uh, and, you know, um, it, it, it's, it, it is quite amazing, I think, when, when we hear people saying we've got Brexit done. Well, I, I think we've got, a, we've got a few years to go yet before we iron out all the issues that, uh, that we've got to go through. So look, for the moment, Duncan, thank you very much. Um, I now wanted to move on and take questions. from James Conney. Is it your opinion that UK approved, approved bodies are allowed to adopt the test certificates of products under AVCP System 3, already tested by EU notified body, without the need for retesting the products in the UK to allow the use of UK CA marking and CE marking? Right. I'll better tell you that, shall I? Duncan, yeah. As far as I know, uh, it is down to the UK approved body to actually make their own mind up what, what they will accept and what they will reject. Uh, so therefore, that being the case, they can turn around and accept all the test reports from a European notified body, laboratory or whatever it is. Uh, that being the case, there shouldn't be an issue. The main problem I think we've got here is the Europe, the, the British uh, approved body, UK approved bodies, actually mm. taking on the legal entity of everything they take on board themselves from some other organisation that's produced it. So they have to satisfy themselves that what they are taking on board, if I can say, is legitimate. And in my opinion, for most of the European notified bodies, that will be the case. There are one or two European bodies, I've got, I'm afraid to say, uh, which even industry has got a question mark over some aspects of what they they uh, they, they they produce. Uh, so if you're taking on the legal responsibility for everything, you've got to make sure that everything is absolutely straight for yourselves first, and that that's the issue. Thank you, Duncan. Um, another question from Andy Williamson. Peter, the question yet. The question I have is that you talk about a cliff edge regarding product not being tested and certified. Do you really believe that the industry will stop buying and selling these products or even worse, will the market continue to buy and sell uncertified products? If the, la if the lady who is going to do what to stop this or what will be the potential implications? So, uh, great question, Andy. Thank you. Um, there, there is always an element of will the industry follow the rules um, and will they really uh, do that? What we're trying to do at the moment is, is avoid that cliff edge, is avoid the possibility of that cliff edge by making it very clear to government where things could go in a worst case scenario. Um, now, if, if, we, if we can continue with the progress we have been making so far, we will avoid that possibility of a cliff edge and we will get to a point where things will change to ensure that we can smoothly transition, which is what I've been describing. If we, if we had a worst case scenario, though, um, yes, of course, there would be a blurring of edges. But what we don't want is, is construction and in particular construction products to be seen in a bad light, particularly at the moment when we have just gone through the Grenfell inquiry uh, on, on the section on products, particularly when we are actually trying to um, build back the image of the industry, build back the image of the, of the sector. Uh, and and uh, a clear uh, and obvious um, breaking of the rules, I would suggest is not in anyone's interest at all for, for um, any part of the industry. So we want to try and avoid that. But yes, of course, things might go on that we, we don't like the look of. And who will be looking? Well, uh, as, of, as of yesterday, we do have a new regulator in the room um, and they have powers 
and they have the ability and can bring sanction to bear. So we not only have a building regulator, we also have a product regulator. Uh, and I'd suggest as new, uh, as new organisations, they will be very keen to, to make sure that they are listened to. And I really don't want to test that. I really don't want us to get into any of that uh, at all. So I'm, I'm going to plan for uh, the, the, very, the very best of things, but clearly we may get into some tricky waters, but we certainly want to avoid them. Thanks, Peter. Um, okay, we have a question from Mark Booth. Are the challenges we face here separate from those the Construction Product Information Code is aiming to solve? This could connect to what you were saying. Or could the solution to both issues and aims be shared? Maybe I can kick off with that and Duncan, you can come in. So uh, again, really good question. The, the, actually, the, they are slightly different. The, the issue with CA marking is about the UK transition, transitioning from a European perspective into a homegrown perspective. And the changes in, in, uh, in the government's mind is about ensuring that effectively the UK runs its own, runs its own shop. And that's about self-determination. So I, I understand why we are, uh, dropping CE mark and moving a CA mark and that's very much about a national vision and a national direction. The, the, the perspective of the Code for Construction Information is very much focused at the moment anyway on a domestic uh, situation and that domestic situation that we're addressing is around making sure that all product information that's produced in the UK is honest, open, trustworthy up to date and available. Now, in time, that there is a vision for the for the code for construction product information that would take us beyond the UK. But for the moment, we're limiting it to just focusing on the homegrown market. And I think probably that I should leave it there. Anything else you wanted to add to that, Duncan? No, uh, the UKCA marking is all about requirements for the product to meet the legal requirements to enter the marketplace. The Code for Concession Product Information is really saying to industry, when you put some advertising material out there, when you put product information out there, make sure it is accurate. Um, the technical boys can say this is the information what happens to that information when it is given to the marketing departments or the external companies that try and sell the products and put the blurb together that you see on the television or you see in the magazine somewhere. Uh, that, that's where you, you get a graying of the area. And I think that that's the bit that needs to be sorted out. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, we have another question from Steon. Sorry if I don't pronounce your name very well. Um, when would you expect to have an answer to the possibility of mutual recognition from MHCLG? My personal view is I don't think mutual recognition is going to happen. Much as I would like it to, uh, to transpire, I don't think the Europeans are going to play ball at all. So I think we're going to have to weather a storm on that one. Mm. Uh, and, and I'd absolutely agree, Duncan. We, we've heard several times, both from, uh, from sources in this country and from sources in Europe, uh, that, there, that at the moment, the Commission will not sanction even the start of a conversation on mutual recognition. So it, at the moment, it's a non-starter. Thank you. Um... We are having difficulties with freight transport and specifically finding drivers. It seems that many foreign drivers are put off coming here post-Brexit. Is the industry doing anything about this? So, um, yes, the, the, the Road Haulage Association has been, has been lobbying government strongly with regard to uh, the lack of drivers. Um, they've also been trying to, to fast track new drivers in terms of training 
and uh, and, and getting licenses um, pushed through because obviously we, we don't want we don't want anybody driving a truck that's that's not fully trained and, and fully licensed. Um, and, and I also think that going forward, the industry has got to recognise that we, we possibly need to make um, we, we need to make the conditions um, a little bit more attractive because uh, we, we do recognise that a lot of drivers of construction um, haulage have been attracted away uh, driving for the supermarkets who've been gearing up uh, home delivery teams. Uh, and, and that has been another pressure on the amount of drivers that, that are available. Uh, and equally, as we try and mature the, the, the whole UK um, and EU uh, bureaucracy and border transfer uh, position, I think we will get to a position where European drivers are l less reluctant, shall we say, to take on driving into the UK. But at the moment, I can see there their worries and frustrations over the time spent. So there's, there's, there's several aspects to this and, and certainly some of them are being progressed at the moment. I think some of the issues are also pandemic uh, as well, uh, Peter, on this, that people would prefer to be in their own land, as it were, uh, when they've got to isolate um, uh, rather than being stuck over here for uh, weeks on end, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So we have another question. What about mutual recognition and EU and B tests in the creation of UK CA marks? I think we've rather answered that, that have we not? When we talk generally about the mutual recognition, uh, uh, Fabi, uh, if mutual recognition happens, everything would, uh, most of the issues would go away. Um, but in my opinion, I don't think it's going to happen, quite frankly. So uh, it's it's a question of having to weather the storm uh, and get what answers we can from our government and uh, see how, how that affects uh, people from the other side of the channel as well. Thanks, Duncan. We have one last question. Um, will the WEEE directive and ROHS be affected by the move away from European regulations? Uh, w -E -E, that, um, that's a, something to do with electrical stuff, isn't it? Uh, I can't, I can't I, quite remember that one. Yeah, I, I'm struggling to place that, to be honest with you. And um, what was the other RO? ROHS. I think, Mark, uh, you can maybe write a comment or write an email afterwards and we can get that. Yeah, ask, ask, yes, ask them to send that one in and uh, we'll investigate that a bit further. Mm. Okay, um, so I think we are done for today. Once again, I want to thank you everyone for joining this webinar. Uh, we hope you find you found it interesting. If you have any further questions or comments, you can email me and I will pass um, your questions on to the right person in the team. If you're interested in joining CPA, please have a look at our website or feel free to contact uh, me. Finally, the recording of this webinar will be available over the next 48 hours on the CPA website. Thank you and have a nice rest of the day. Bye. Cheers, everybody.